class or something, make sure and get good notes. Guys, if you have good notes on this one, this is an easy exam. Okay, it's just very straightforward. All right, so first thing I want to start off, I want to kind of go back and recap a little bit of what we talked about last class, and that was interest, rights, and power. Okay, so that's the order. Interest first. Always try to satisfy interest. Then, if we can't do that, we'll try to see who's right. And then the last thing you want to do is exert power. And the, both of those last two, there's a winner and a loser if you have a power situation or somebody who's wrong and somebody who's right. So that's why it's always cheapest, easiest, suggested first to try to find a solution that's workable for both people. All right, so then write these down. These, you guys, have you guys had marketing yet? No? Anybody had marketing? What are the four P's of marketing? Price, product, promotion, place. Okay, so I'm going to give you the four P's of negotiation. Okay, these are mine that I made up. <laughs> Number one, preparation. It's the single most important thing in a negotiation. Doing your homework. They're won or lost before the negotiation ever starts. So P number one is preparation. Number two, practice. You guys think negotiation is a skill you can get better at? How do you get better? Practice, practice and, and evaluating. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? And, and so and find situations where you can engage in that. Number three, patience. And I read you an article, I think, earlier in the semester from uh, Dr. Karras that just said patience, the super tool. A lot of times, if you, if you don't rush into something, you've got the opportunity to make a better deal. Plus, it, it makes the other party uncomfortable sometimes when you're, when you're deliberate. And then the last thing, the last P, is persistence. Okay? Stay after it. There's times when you can just wear somebody down if you'll just stay after it for a long time. Okay? So those are the Four P's. Oh, okay. They said three P's. No, four P's. Four P's of marketing, four P's of negotiation. We're not going to short negotiation for marketing. Okay, we've got four. I should have done five, but anyway, we'll stick with four. All right. So, um, moving on, there's three phases to a negotiation. Phase one is called the information phase. Okay, information phase. So, what do you think we do in the information phase? Gather information. Try to find out what the other party wants, why do they want what they want, and you do that by asking questions. Okay, once again, listener, got to be a good listener. Then one of the things that you could use is called a blocking technique, and this is something you can use in the information phase. And a blocking technique is when you answer a question with a question. Well, how much would you pay for this? Well, what would you sell it for? Okay, so I'm not answering a question, and that's not a bad one for somebody saying, well, what kind of starting salary are you hoping to get? And so without you divulging information and selling yourself short, you could use a blocking tactic and say, well, um, hadn't really thought about it. Is there a starting range that you guys usually offer? And let them throw out the first offer. It may be higher than what you were expecting. Okay, then that also, you could then say, oh, well, I was looking for this range, but it allows you to, I always want somebody to throw out the first price in that, because it may be better than what I'm, what I'm thinking. Um, so if you're able to determine what the other party's really after, um, you can try to satisfy what they're wanting, plus we can achieve our goal also. All right, then that leads us into the next phase, which is the competitive phase. Okay, so we have our information, now we're trying to win. We're trying to win our point, make our point, and you do that, once again, preparation, having facts, and gathering information through the information phase. So your, the information that you give should be backed up with explanations and facts. You should be able to say why you want what you want, why you think it's justified. If you're selling a car, we can go to the Kelly Blue Book and say, well, I've looked up the Blue Book and the NADA, and here's the price range it falls in, which validates what I'm asking. Uh, threats and promises. Always be careful when you're in a negotiation threatening something. That's always a, the, something I would urge you to kind of stay away from. It's always kind of a last thing, but it, there, there may be times when you have to show what the downside would be if the deal's not reached. 
And that's, that's okay, but also kind of how you say it more than what you say may have an impact on the negotiation. Nobody likes to be threatened and say, well, if you don't take this, you know, this is going to happen. Silence and patience. When you have something important to say, say it. Otherwise, zip it. Okay? If you got something to say that's important, say it. Other than that, I'm listening. It's part of the, part of the uh, competitive phase, right. We're trying to win. How does, how does being silent, how is that going to help us win sometimes, maybe? Makes the other person talk more. Exactly. People get uncomfortable when nobody says anything. So they're going to start talking, and maybe what might they do? And they might give you information just to try to get you back on track and try to get the thing start going. You could do that. I mean, it, it, it's something that I promise you it works when you just sit there and they ask, why aren't you saying anything? Well, I'm just thinking, just trying to figure out options. And then they're going to start talking. Uh, limited authority. This is a good one to use also. So. A um, couple of examples. In, anytime you guys are going to be buying cars, you're going to be dealing with a salesperson, and they're going to get you to agree on a price, and then they're going to go, oh, by the way, I've got to go run this by the sales manager. And they may come back and say, well, sorry, I was a little aggressive. He won't approve that deal, but would you do this? But what you're doing is you're trying to get a commitment from that person. So I've already agreed that I would pay 17000 but they come back and go, well, I'm sorry, my sales manager, I, I was a little aggressive there, but he said he'll do it for seventeen four. So that person, you're actually saying, I don't have the right to do that. How can you guys do this? I can do it very easily. I can be shopping for a big ticket item and go, well, that sounds really good, but I really don't buy anything major without talking to my wife first. Higher authority. And that is. <laughs> but is that legit? Yeah, I don't buy anything major without running it by her first. So, but what did I get, what did I accomplish there? I got some time. I, I bought time, but I also, I got them to a price. And so what happens if I come back and say, yeah, my wife, you know, we talked about it, we really can't spend that much. You know, maybe if you could do this, I might could do it, but I, we just, I don't think that's good. How should you handle, um, because I've been in a situation before too, where they're like, well, this, this offer expires if you walk out the door. Okay, we'll talk about that later in the class. It's called an exploding offer. Uh, generally, when people give exploding offers, they're, they're trying to make you make a decision and not giving you time to check alternatives at all. Right. And, and I'll, I'll talk more about it later, but there are legitimate times when, and I can, the quick example was I was hiring a teacher for the fall and it was like July, and I had to have somebody by August, and this guy was kind of jerking me along, and I finally had to tell him, look, we weren't his first choice, but he didn't have his first choice, so he was just kind of stringing us along, and I finally had to tell him, I gotta know something by Friday, because I've gotta have a teacher by August, I gotta move on. The situations you're talking about, like with an apartment or something, well, I'll give you this deal, but it's only good until 5 o'clock today. They're trying to get you to make decisions on the spot. And that they're trying to put pressure on you to not do something else. So you've got to go through a whole evaluative process of what's the reason they're doing that. Okay, one of the last cars I bought, I had a guy do it. Uh, and, I, man, I had worn him down. I mean, talking about persistence, I just worn this guy out. And finally he goes, okay, I'll do it, but it's got to be done by 5 o'clock today. And I said, so you'll sell it to me today, but you won't sell it to me tomorrow. And if I don't do it by five, you're going to have the car still at eight o'clock in the morning. And you didn't say anything. Okay. They're trying to get you to. Yes. Um, does this competitive phase apply to all negotiations or just distributed? Um, pretty much all. Even even in an integrated negotiation, you still got to make your case. Um, you're probably not going to use as many tactics to to really. It's 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 about winning for everybody instead of winning for just you. But you can still use some of these tactics to help you move along in the negotiation to get to where you're trying to get. Yeah, it's a good question. All right. Um, uproar. Okay, here's the situation, kind of like with the miner and the boots. Two questions you need to ask in an uproar situation. So an uproar is kind of a threat. So go back to the miner. The miner said, look, if you don't pay for my boots, then I'm going to organize a strike. So uproar would, and that's an uproar situation, so you would have to ask two questions. Question one is, what's the likelihood they're actually going to do this? 
Okay, so question one in uproar. What's the likelihood they're actually going to do this? So as that mine supervisor, I'm sitting here going, are these guys really going to walk out for a $70 or $80 pair of boots? Are they going to go on strike over that? Then the second question you got to ask is, if I think question one is valid, what's the impact if they do that? Okay, what, what's going to happen if they actually do that? So if you make that rational decision, and so I ask question one, what's the likelihood they're going to go on strike? And if I think that, you know what, I know these knuckleheads and they're just might be stubborn enough that they might do this, then what's the impact of that? How much is it gonna cost me if they go out on strike? A lot more than $80, okay? So that would, that's why you ask those two questions. What's the likelihood it's gonna happen? And then two, if it does happen, what's the impact on the firm? Um, here's a good, this is a good example. This was in uh, Karis's book. I think it was, and it was, it's an example of a higher authority or, um, and he said this guy is a real estate uh, president, CEO of a real estate company. He had 28 August, uh, offices and a magazine salesman came and offered him an ad for $2,000 and he has 28, it's like in the Los Angeles area, so it would have been pretty good coverage for $2,000. The guy thought it wasn't bad, but he also was a negotiator, he liked a negotiator, so he used some of the gambits and he got it down to $800, all right? Just saying, well, you know, I had to get in my office and pitch in. And so then he said, well, let's just try something else. So he told the guy, he said, you know what? That 800 sounds really good, but I really do need to run this by my board of directors. I, I you know, may could make the decision, but I just feel better if I ran it by the board. So he calls the guy back uh, the next day and says, man, I'm really sorry, but the board won't authorize more than $500. And the salesperson said, we'll take it. Okay, so he got him down from 2,000, he did 800 just using regular tactics, then using higher authority, he got him down to 500, and the guy said he was still mad because he thought he could have got him down some more. I mean, that's a guy that really likes to negotiate, but that's a pretty good deal. And think about 28 stores and you're getting an ad for 500 bucks, that's a pretty good, pretty good. And back when, once again, you can tell the story's dated. Um, you guys read magazines anymore? I mean, it, it's one of those industries that really took a hit with the web. So that's its whole. That's an industry that's been turned upside down. Really, is advertising, and the internet changed it. Newspapers, you know, another business that's in really trouble just because they don't have the ad revenue anymore. Yes. Did you just need to speak on the differences between higher authority and limited authority? Same thing. Pretty much same thing. You can use those interchangeable. Higher authority, limited authority. Basically, you're saying, I don't have the right to make the final decision. I've got to check with somebody else. But the advantage of doing that is you get a commitment from the other party. I've got them. He got that guy to $500 or to $800 or $500 and then, or $800. And then he said, look, I can't really, I would do this if I had the uh, power, but I can't do that. You guys could go look at cars now and go, okay, yeah, I think that's a good deal, but I've got to run it by my parents first. And come back and go, yeah, I talked to Pops and he's not, he's not feeling it. So maybe he said he might do this. All right, so just a way to, it's just a, once, once again, it's a tactic that you can use. And the other thing is be aware that it's being used on you. And the same thing that, that James, you recognize that people try to uh, do exploding offers on you. Well, I did, a, I did a test drive once and the guy like, I said, oh, can I get your business card or something? Similar thing, I had to run this by my parents. And he goes, oh, no, let me just add you. My, like, you know, and he, like, added me in his, like, contacts or something like that. So he kind of had me there. Of course, you can add me a business card and never call him again or something. But now that he has my cell number, he can Right. Well, no, and they're gonna, then they're going to bombard you with, right. um, you know, I still get emails from Capital Porsche all the time. All right. So that is, uh, those some more tactics, okay? This is called bowlwareism. B O U L W A R I S M. Okay, Bowlerism. It's take it or leave it. And it was named after the guy's name was Lemuel Bowler. He was one of the uh, labor people for General Electric years ago, and so they named this strategy after him. It was basically it's called Bowlerism. Take it or leave it. But in reality, is take it or leave it a negotiation? No. Nah. Yeah, an ultimatum. It's not a negotiation, but this guy made it famous, and he was a very hard negotiator 
on labor for General Electric. Um, Br'er Rabbit, B-R apostrophe E-R, and these are just terms that have been given to strategy. Br'er Rabbit, caring more uh, about how poorly your opponent has done instead of how well you've done. Okay. Caring more about how poorly your opponent does than how well you do. Why would I ever, can anybody think of a situation, I can, where you would really care more about how poorly your other person did? Well, that's the divorce. That's exactly it. Divorce. And sometimes it becomes about making the worst deal for that other party and you just go, screw it, I don't care about me, I'm going to cause you pain. And one of you guys did that in here, that 7.7 7 to 1 group. At that point, was it not more about inflicting pain on the other party than, because whoever took one point basically didn't care about themselves. You obviously could have got a better deal. So it was about inflicting pain to somebody else. All right, horrible strategy. You guys should feel bad. Yes? B-R apostrophe E-R. Br'er Rabbit, it's an old cartoon character. All right, so here, I had a, a buddy once that was getting a divorce, and, and divorces get nasty, especially when there's a lot of assets involved. And so you know what the simple answer, how much divorce cost? Half. Okay, about. <laughs> so here was, here was my suggestion. I said, you need to tell your lovely wife that you'll either put the assets in two piles and she can have first pick, or you'll put them in two piles and she can have first pick. Is that a good strategy? Why not? So if I'm, if I'm putting them in two piles knowing that she's going to get first pick, I'm going to make it, try to make it, neither one of them not attractive to her. If she's doing the same thing and I get first pick, she's going to do the same thing. And there's, there's a lot of, guys, divorce is, is not only just the, the emotional part of it, but it is the single, when I talk personal finance, I always brought up divorce. There's nothing that will ruin you financially more quicker than a divorce. And I know sometimes maybe you can't help it, but um, it's not it's not a good process for anybody, and it leads to a lot of um, really negative negotiating. And you guys, probably everybody here knows people that have gone through it, and some have gone through very nasty. So uh, my advice is stay out of it if you can. That's uh, why you get a prenup. <laughs> well, that does, uh, yeah, if you can find somebody that will sign one of those, absolutely. That'll work. Uh, I love you, and I want to be with you forever, but could you sign this, please? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Nothing says I love you like a prenup. <laughs> All right, Mutt and Jeff. Mutt and Jeff, another tactic. And out there you can put good cop, bad cop. The first person you send in to negotiate is a real jerk. And after that person leaves, you send in somebody who's really nice. Psychologically, the studies show that people are more willing to give up uh, in concessions to that other person just because they're not dealing with some jerk anymore. And that's the same thing you guys have all seen all the TV shows and all good cop, bad cop, where the first one comes in and roughs them up kind of, and the next one comes in and is real nice. The same thing can work in negotiating. Is that, uh, the name is just good cop, bad cop? Mutton Jeff. There's no, that's a, a like a 60s cartoon show. Yes? Um, is this like the third phase or? I'm sorry? No, no, we're still in the, we're still in tactics used in the competitive phase. Is good cop, bad cop something we use in the competitive phase? Yeah, absolutely. We can gain, try to gain, um, try to get concessions during that point. All right, another good one. Belly up. Okay. Belly up. That's the negotiator who claims they're not a good negotiator and ask for, um, ask for mercy. Well, I'm not really sure how this goes. Uh, you know, am I supposed to make you a counteroffer or something? And my favorite, you guys remember who Lou Holtz was? You guys know the name Lou Holtz? He was a football coach at Notre Dame, and they'd be playing Navy or somebody that, you know, they're, they're, 40 point underdog, uh, 40 point favorite over, and Lou would go, boy, I just don't know how we're going to keep up with that Navy team. They have such fine athletes, and they're just so well coached, really going to push us to the limit, and they beat them 60 to 3 or something like that. 
that's belly up. You know, kind of that poor mouthing, boy, I just don't know, I'm not very good at this, maybe you could kind of help me. You're just trying, trying to get somebody to get their guard down. All right, so that's the last of the, uh, and those are all tactics you can use during the competitive phase. And then the last thing is called the cooperative phase. Okay, the cooperative phase, that's when we've all had our say, we've all got our facts out, and then we try to come together based on everything that's been said and make our agreement. Okay, so we had the information phase, we had the competitive phase, and then we close out with the cooperative phase. All right, and once again, probably the big part of that after you gather information is all those things I gave you are tactics you can use to try to make your case, try to win concessions during the competitive phase. And then at the end, we come to an agreement. All right, and this is from an a article then. It's called The Secrets of Power Negotiating. Um, and the first thing it says, the myth of win-win. Okay, the myth, M-Y-T-H, myth of win-win. And it just said, rarely are both, are both parties happy at the end of a negotiation. Okay, rarely are both parties happy. And that was why we want to try to reconcile interest. Is there a win-win situation? The bottom line is salespeople, car salespeople want the highest price because they're on commission. You want the lowest price because you're spending the money for it. So rarely, a lot of times, there's not necessarily a, a win-win situation, especially in distributive negotiation. <coughs> Where did you say that was from? Uh, it's just a, it's an article. It's more real life articles written by people than it is like an academic, like a lot of these other chapters are. All right, so the next, yes? Um, would it, um, an article written by real people be more prone to biases or inaccuracy? <clears throat> yeah, but also I think real world experience, the, the, and, and I told you at the very start, this is an academic institution, so I'm teaching an academic class. But I think in any academic discipline, and academic is research and all that, I think real life experience a lot of time can add to that academic product that we have. The same thing like when I teach management. Okay, fine, you memorize the definition of um, a, a decentralized organization. Okay, and so you know the definition of that. What is that? What's the value of that? Or distributive justice. What's the value of that? Versus, I'm going to tell you a story of a situation where this happened, which hopefully is a lot more valuable to you than just memorizing definitions. So I think, to me, experience, and that, I, I can only go back to my favorite teachers that I had <coughs> were ones that could tell me the concept and then bring it to life by telling me a situation when it happened. So this, this is more the real life. Yeah, it's saying that a lot of the people that I've, are like the grown-ups, they say the best training is on the job, or like best like teachers kind of. In, in management, and same thing, you can take somebody and put them in a classroom for 10 years. Uh, I'd take somebody who's managed for two years over that person who's been in a classroom for 10 years, right? There's certain things that you just learn by doing, and why? Because you make mistakes. You learn better from mistakes or from uh, success. Mistakes. Why? Because there's pain to mistakes. It, it hurts. And that's why experience. Same thing. You guys are, are out of this class. I want you to be aware of stuff, but you're going to screw up some negotiations. But then I hope you, the big thing is that you realize what you did wrong, and then in the future, you're able to do better. And that comes with the second P, practice. Okay? Do your homework, practice, try to become better. This, I do believe, it's like a, it's like a plumber, an electrician, the more you do it, I think the better you're going to get. You know, and certainly there's a level that where you're going to peak and, and not going to be able to get a whole lot better. But the big thing is just an awareness of, number one, it's okay to negotiate. Number two, it's okay to ask. And then which goes to the next uh, thing is always ask for more than you expect to get. Always ask for more than you expect to get. What might happen sometimes? You get it. Okay, I'm going to ask for more than I expect, and if they take it, good. Okay? But it also leaves me room to come down and make the session to get to where I really want to be. But always ask for more, never hurt. There's no downside to doing that, as long as that, remember that term, maximum plausible position, you just can't make it to where you insult somebody. Okay? You can't offer so such a low ball offer that they're gonna tell you to go away. But always, if, if I, my price for the house is 250, then uh, I may, you know, ask 230. I'll offer 230. Okay, I'm willing to pay 250, but I'll start at 230. 
And we may end up at 240, 237. Uh, another rule of thumb, the less you know about the opponent, the higher your initial position should be. Okay, the less you know about your opponent, the higher your initial position should be. Okay, the less you know about your opponent, the higher your initial position should be. Once again, what are we doing? I don't know anything about my opponent, so I'm not going to take any chances. I'm going to throw out a number higher than I normally would if it's somebody I've dealt with a long time and I kind of know how they operate. I know the range I can be in. Somebody I don't know, throw it out. Once again, what's the worst thing that happens? They say no. All right, then we come down to the realistic range. Um, and I just mentioned my maximum plausible position, the most you can ask for and still be credible. Okay, the most you can ask for and yet still be credible. All right, another thing, never say yes to the first offer. Never say yes to the first offer. Even if it lands right where you want it to land? Okay, so now I've got a starting point of where I want. So is there a better place than a starting point? I suppose. Well, if, if yeah. what's the worst thing that happens? They say no. They say no. Okay, so two things to put by this though. They tell you, think about this from the person you're dealing with side. Uh, if you take the first offer, it can leave your opponent with two negative thoughts. Okay, and the one is, I could have done better. Okay, I could have done better. So if you offer me 100 for, you know, my old surfboard and I take it, First thing that goes through my mind, and that's exactly right, I should have, I should have offered less. We could have done better. Right. And the second thing is, something might be wrong. If somebody jumps on an offer, a first offer, that might be a signal that there's something out there that you don't know about. Right? So you try to, but, I, and, and those are reasons that the guy that wrote the article says, my reason for not taking the first offer is that's their starting point. So why not, if their starting point is where I want it in, why not push it for more? But if they come in at your asking price, you can't really raise it from there. Like at your asking price, you can't. But this is something that somebody just offers you. So there's not like a set price. There's not like a, yeah, you don't have a set price yet, right? You, you uh, or, yeah, because that's, that's always, once again, goes to getting them throw out the first price. Hey, I've got something for sale, you've got something for sale, and a buddy goes, well, how much do you want for it? Or somebody goes, how much do you want for it? And you're thinking you'd be good to get 100, and you go, oh, I really hadn't thought about it. And he goes, i give you 120. And then what's wrong with you saying, well, I was kind of thinking 130. Even in your mind, if 100 was okay, if they start the bar at 120, generally, are they starting at the high end of the range that they're willing to pay or the low end? The low end. Right. So, and then you say, well, I was thinking of one third. And just move it up from there. Because that's, that's their baseline. Guys, the first offer, keep that in mind. The first offer somebody throws out, is that going to be the most they want to pay? Probably not. That's going to be the bottom range where I'm starting. All right. Um, flinch. I like this one. Sometimes you do this without even thinking about it. It's just when you make some kind of gesture that suggests you're in shock about what somebody just offered you. And once again, what are we trying to do? Trying to set a tone that, I can't believe you're wanting that for that. So you flinch. Uh, play reluctant buyer or seller. That's a good one. Reluctant buyer or seller. Play reluctant buyer or seller. Somebody asks you about something and you really don't care about it, you know, but you go, well, it's been in the family for a lot of years and, you know, it's got a lot of sentimental value, so I really don't think I can take that for it, but, you know, you can make me an offer. It's something you really could care less about. Yes? Is all those other never say it to the first offer? No, this is just another tactic. Okay. 
Okay, another tactic, yep. Reluctant buyer or seller. Next one's called device technique. Vice technique. It's when you say you'll have to do better. Okay, you'll have to do better. Vice technique. Vice? Vice, like you guys know what a vice is when you yeah, squeeze vice. something? No, not vice, not that. It's a vice that holds something that you can tighten up, like on a, a work tool bench, a vice. Okay. Not familiar with that? I'm familiar with the tool, I never knew it was called that. It's a vice. Okay, so what's an easy answer? There's an easy way you should never get caught by the vice tactic. You'll have to do better. So what's your next words out of your mouth? I can't. No. Think. How much better? Give me a prize. If you just keep, if they just keep saying you got to do better, you keep throwing out a number, where's it going to stop? Okay. Fine. Tell me where the, what's the prize? Well, you got to do better. Okay, well, tell me a price, and I'll tell you whether I can do better or not. Okay, don't, don't get sucked into hypotheticals. Well, if I said it was this, would you take it? Well, are you saying that? Are you going to sell it for that? Okay, don't, don't get sucked into hypotheticals, because what are you doing? You're giving information that's pertinent to the deal without any kind of commitment from them. So stay out of, stay out of that game. Um, here's an interesting thing, too. Don't worry about price. Sometimes people want to pay more. You guys buy that? Why do people sometimes want to pay more? They think it's higher quality. Exactly. Um, you guys know the big thing, and, and I had somebody I know that went did a tour here a while back, but like Flowers Baking, you guys know who they are? They're in Thomasville, Georgia, and they make bread. So... They make probably 20 different labels of bread, and it's all come out of the same bread making process, and they put a different bag on it and it changes the price of it. Same thing with a lot of the canned foods you buy, Del Monte and all, canned by the same company that does Publix brand. Why do we want to buy Del Monte? Because there's a perceived quality about it, right? So sometimes, you can, by just asking more, what does that suggest? They have a higher quality product. Yeah, you can buy something cheaper, but mine's priced because this is, it, it's a higher quality. And once again, starting with a higher price, what's, what, can we come down? Yeah, you can always come down. But start with something high. Um, another interesting thing. Don't split the difference. Okay. Always let the other person split the difference. If you split the difference, you giving up. If you, if I have something uh, offered on Craigslist, it's a dining room table for two hundred, and you offer me a hundred, and then I go one fifty. Okay, I've given away fifty dollars just by one sentence out of my mouth. Why do you want to? And I can't tell you how many times negotiators split the difference. Why don't you want to split the difference? better. You can do better than splitting it, but it's relative to your asking price. Okay, if that other person's price is way low, then splitting the difference, they're going to gain an advantage by that. Why are car dealers, why will they always come down on cars? Because they have a the market. Because they've set that price to allow them to do so. Right. And if you go in and pay those no haggle pricing, I mean, you're, I'm going to trust you that this is the best deal that I can get. And these people get away with it because some people just don't like to have it. They don't like to negotiate. But that doesn't necessarily mean, as a matter of fact, it probably means you're not going to get the best deal. So don't, don't be afraid to, to go through the process. And that's the other thing of the class is trying to educate you that it's okay to negotiate and understand where people, where they're coming from. Um, the art of concession. Very important in management as a boss. It says, don't get in a pattern and settle the same way every time. And what happens if you do that? Any time, any of you guys got people like that, you can push them and you know when the line's gonna be drawn? Your parents maybe? Get in the same thing? 
when you get into a pattern, you become pre predictable. And it makes it easy for people to know how, how hard they can <coughs> play. So you don't want to become predictable. Make time your ally. I spent a lot of time on this. Anytime you have time, it puts you in a position of strength. Okay? If you have time, it, it allows you to make a better deal. And, and the worst deals that people make, and think about it, I don't know if you guys know anybody that got caught up in the real estate deal back in 2007, 2008. You, you got bought the second house, never sold the first, market crashes, so now I'm sitting here with two mortgages. Guys, you can sell any house in a day if you want to. And that's a factual statement. How can you sell it? Lower the price. Make it a bargain. So when do people do that? When you're running out of time. Same thing. So when people have to buy or sell, you make the worst deal. So that's why, and, and that, you guys are taking a personal finance class, and I hope, I don't know, I, I, I know Professor Calhoun, he's, I, he's a great guy, my son had him and loved him. One of the things I hope he's, he's covering in there, if you guys heard the, firm, the term emergency fund, okay, I can't tell you how important that is, that early in your life you need a three to six month emergency fund. Okay, what does that allow you to do? Buy time. Quit a job, it ins it's insurance in case you get fired or laid off from a job. I can survive for three to six months, which should be enough window to be able to get another job, right? And, and I can't tell you how important that emergency fund is. That's the whole Dave Ramsey thing is. You want a cushion, and I can remember being in my first job, and there was a time that I was pretty miserable, and you know I ground through it. But it, it was luckily I did that, so I would have been able if it got things got so bad. Or what happens? You get in a situation where something's happening that's unethical, or something that's happening that's illegal, and don't think that can't happen. You could have a very unscrupulous boss that might ask you to do something that's unethical or illegal, and then you're jeopardizing a lot more than just losing your job. So you may need to walk away. Well. Uh, you think your financial situation is going to play a part in your ability and the decisions you make? Yeah, so the, the sooner you can get financially stable, and by stable meaning giving yourself that cushion, you're buying yourself time to be able to make a better deal. Same thing about not having, if I were unemployed, then I would probably, the first thing I would do is take a job. And it probably wouldn't be what I wanted, but if I didn't have time, I would take a job, then I would start looking for what I really wanted. But I would not, I would try to bridge that gap. But you can do that and you can put yourself in a, in a stronger position if you have some leverage to be able to sit and wait. Uh, most, most dangerous moment, okay, most dangerous moment, right after a negotiation closes, okay, right after a negotiation closes. And that's when, I think I've covered this term, nibbling occurs. People are happy about closing the deal. And so ask for, you know, if you're on the other side, ask for something little. And same thing, you guys go in to men's warehouse and you buy, you're getting ready for your job and you need three suits and six shirts and all. The deal closes, ask them to throw in a tie. Guarantee you they'll do it. Hey, I've just spent $1,000 with you and you won't give me a tie? And that's nibbling, but it's right after the deal. Then the last thing, the most powerful weapon, what's the most powerful weapon, most powerful tool you have in negotiation? Listening. That's a, that's a good, but it's not the most powerful. Away. The ability to walk away. When you, when you can walk out, when you're in that car room, who wants to buy more, to sell that car more? You want to, that person want to sell it more or you want to buy it more? That person wants to sell it more because if you walk out, they don't know when the next person is coming in to look at that. So the ability to walk away, and that's when guys, especially with cars, that's when you know you have them at rock bottom. Because if you don't, they're going to they're gonna walk out with you. Have you guys ever had, you guys don't know how many of you guys are buying your own cars yet, but if you're not at bottom yet, that salesman is going to come out with you. Okay? If they let you walk, then that pretty much means they can't. They can't go any lower because they do not want to lose that sale. I've had one ask me before, what do I have to do to keep you from walking out of here? <laughs> That's a stupid question. Yeah. <laughs> you got to meet this price. Well, I can't do that. Well, you ask. Yeah. Okay. That will keep me. You give me this price on that car and I'm, I'm, we're done. Okay. I'm not looking anymore. 
But in most cases, they're not going to do that. But I have had a salesman, and this was in Arkansas years ago, basically follow me out and go, wait, come back. I think I can do better. They wanted to sell, sell it that bad. So the ability to walk away. Terrace tells a story that he bought a car. His, his uh, daughter wanted a car. And so she asked him to negotiate the deal for her. And he said, I was able to save her 1500 He said, um, the one question he asked her before he went to the negotiation is, do I got to buy the car? I mean, do you absolutely want the car? And she said, yes. And he said, that probably cost her $500 because she wouldn't let me walk away. So he said, I was able to get them down a little more, but I wasn't able to use the most powerful tool in the belt, which is the ability to turn and walk away. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna do, like later on in the semester, I'm gonna do uh, like just a little seminal, seminar on kind of car buying, because that's one of the things you guys will be doing repeatedly during your life. And I'm gonna show you some tips, kind of from looking at websites and all, where, and, and give you some stuff that'll help you when you go to buy and sell cars. And you guys also know the best way to buy a car is with cash, right? When you trade in something and they're going to give you X amount for your trade in, that's always going to work in their favor, all right? And I don't care how good a deal you think you get, and, and you can, you can certainly save money and get a better deal than just going in and paying what they're asking. They're still making money because they're not going to sell it if they're not. And they're taking that trade in. And while they give you less in trade, a lot of times those guys don't even sell those cars to retail. They'll take them to auction, which means they're getting really not much money for it. Auction is the, the worst way to go because people are buying them. People buy them at auction to resell, so they've got to buy them cheap at auction. So a lot of those car dealers, especially the new car dealers, if you're trading an older car, they're not going to sell older cars because it hurts their reputation. Older cars break down and it gives them a bad name. That's why new car dealers don't sell generally really older cars. There's niche car people that sell older cars. And so they're gonna wholesale that car. That's why they can't give you a lot for it. You can always sell it for cash. And then when you have cash, you're in a stronger buying position because you don't have to trade. The problem is now you've got to sell your car. It's a lot easier to trade one in. And especially I always feel, my worst thing is I don't want to sell somebody a car to an individual that I know something's wrong with that car. If you sell it to a dealer, they're gonna give you rock bottom price and then they can fix it for you know, probably a quarter of what you're gonna spend fixing it. So that's, that's the other thing. I, I just always would feel bad selling somebody a car I knew something was wrong with. That's just had something that's real wrong, I'd trade it or I'd try to spend the money to get it fixed, but then you're kind of <coughs> feeding the purpose of what you can sell it. And it's a pain, you know, where, where do you sell a car now if you wanna sell your own car? Craigslist. Craigslist. Yeah, and so you got all these people come to your house and it's not a good, yeah, not a good situation. But it's still the best way. If you because you're gonna get wholesale, you're gonna get retail for your car, then you're gonna have cash, which gives you the most buying power when you go to buy a car. So I'll I'll cover that and show you some stuff on a website that'll work. All right, so that's that's for the you've got everything for the exam. Just make sure the big thing is just make sure you got good notes, with the exception of there'll be two or three questions from the lawyer on Thursday. So make sure you uh, make sure you come to class on Thursday. And, and, and if not, if you've missed or some of your friends have missed, you know, make sure you guys, or if you guys want to as a class, get a study guide together and, and pass it out, that's fine. Because this, this test is very easy, as long as you got the right material down. Not hard. All right, that's it. Came in late, make sure and let me know. Tuesday. It's Tuesday, yes.
this Thursday. This is just going to be another day like this, right? Yeah, it's going to be. Well, it's going to be a lawyer. Oh, right. So, yeah. 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 I'll get it. Yeah, we good. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a few things. Alright, you can call my time find my last name. Um, last check. Here. Do you know what we're doing on November 21st? Oh, this Tuesday. Remind me Thursday. I'll tell you. I actually, I have something on there, but I'm... So we're not having class? Thank you. Spontaneous action yeah. to show surprise okay. at the deal. Like I told you, I had to pick up a pack of batteries at a convenience store one time, and I said, "Ouch!" My son was with me. I thought I'd hurt myself, and I was just saying, "Ouch!" Yeah, it's just yeah. ridiculous. They mark stuff up about 400 percent. Yeah, that's why it's convenience. I was just like, no, no, we leave tomorrow. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. So the next. Yeah, to, right, just, just, just those, just these, those two, basically two lectures and notes, and maybe one or two questions from guest speaker. Okay. So can you get so, a, somebody from speaker? Yeah, I'll show you guys. Okay. Uh, no, only, no more than like three questions, maybe just two. Okay. All right. Thank so you. Think you should be good. Um, I think I just yeah, like all talking classes. Uh, okay. No, just send me something. Okay. And I'm also going to be on Thursday. Okay. Just try to get notes. Okay, cool. Are you? Yeah. All right. Some notes. Also, um, would you be able to go through my exams with me? Sure. Like, my movie with Um. 11.20, I mean, I might have a little time right now. I have class at 2 o'clock. Yeah, me too. Okay. I mean, we could try. But if not, uh, when I get out of that class at 3.15, I'm available. Okay. Where would you be? My office, 416, in the business building. Where's that? Huh? The Rosetta building? The RBA, the Rosetta Business Annex. So it's the yeah. tall, the new building. Is that, not, is that not the? Um, it's connected. You have the old building right there, but then you have the new buildings over here to the right. Yeah. So fourth floor, four sixteen, about three fifteen. Oh right, yeah. Yeah, the, the other building doesn't have four stories. Oh right. So you can't get up. And you said there's no class before. Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yep. Oh wow. Nice. Um, all those tactics you mentioned at the end, that that wouldn't fall under the. No, 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 no. no, the agreement phase was very simply just okay, write so down those the agreement. More those are more, they're more, they're, it's actually it's a different article, but if, yeah, they're also, you could incorporate those things into the competitive okay, phase. Okay, because it seemed like they fit, but like you mentioned the agreement. Yeah, it was, just, was, talking about tactics and I was, it was just a different first. article. Okay. Yeah, two different people wrote, the one guy did it for the three phases and just listed a few, then the other article was secrets of power negotiating, which is the same thing, power negotiators use tactics. Okay. That's what you And you said you used to work in logistics, right? Yeah. Okay. Supply chain management. Okay. Seems like a pretty interesting yeah. topic. I guess I don't know. Like there's one, um, God, my other class, there's two kids, and I don't know the name of the company, but two of my um, students in the other class have a interview, and in, they're out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and they're flying up, matter of fact, this week, I think, they're flying up to, or was it last, into last week to interview with them, and it's for a sales rep job. Where they're gonna, it's a six month training program, and then they give you a territory. Selling break or no, selling, you know, I'm just gonna go over I, I, I enjoy that. Those yeah, I know. Like, it's like I'll read about supply chain, and like, what I really like to do is like look at something like a system and then like figure out what's wrong with it and like try and make it better. And like, supply chains like, seem complex and like you can add a lot of value to the bottom line, which makes I mean, you, you could even you could even do that working. You wouldn't even have to work in the industry. You could, most companies have, like, I know some of our, I remember some of our big customers. 
they would do some with us roadway, but then they would have some UPS business, they would have some expedited business, so there could be all kinds of different. Um, okay, yeah, because I was just like looking into like sort of like maybe what degrees I would need and like. You like I think. And they said it was like, I mean, all the research I was doing like said it was pretty generalized. Like you could just use like you a could, you could probably do it with this. I mean, no, with, I was with, thinking that too, but I was looking like. 